In 1984, a game was promised that would be so significant, so groundbreaking that it would change the world of not just gaming but computing as well. This tantalising, heralded piece of software was teased through an array of clever advertising, news stories and even made its way onto a TV show. Even if you didn't own a computer, this was exciting stuff, but if you did, it was next level drama. And it was called Bandersnatch. Now, for UK Netflix viewers, this might sound familiar, given an interactive TV show that riffed on the idea was screened just a few years back. But for anyone else, it may just be a myth, a legend, a fictional character from Lewis Carroll's 1871 Through the Looking Glass, or even an entire book, Bandersnatch, an adventure story by Desmond Loudon, released in 1969. But whatever your connection, it's time to get to the bottom of it. 1980 was the infancy of the UK microcomputer scene. It was the year that Sinclair released what was widely considered to be the first affordable home computer, the ZX80. It was the year that Sinclair's main rival launched their Atom computer. It was also the year that a company, Bugbyte, was formed to capitalise on this new craze of hardware, which of course needed software. Founded by Tony Barden and Tony Milner, it was a pioneering force for developing games on these early machines. But really, this was just the beginning. By 1982, the computing scene had advanced rapidly. Acorn had produced the BBC Micro, Sinclair had introduced the ZX81, Commodore the VIC-20, and on the horizon was the C64, along with another Sinclair product, the ZX Spectrum, which would truly transform Britain from a quaint little island to a digital beacon packed with home micros. Naturally, more software houses would pop up to meet this demand, with three members of Bugbyte, Mark Butler, David Lawson, and Eugene Evans forming one of these, Imagine Software, on the 17th of September 1982. As a Bugbyte sales manager and programmer respectively, Butler and Lawson would run the company, with Evans brought on board also for his programming finesse. Working out of Liverpool Studios, from the go, Imagine had a different feel to other software houses. Games like Arcadia, which was actually written by David Lawson, were an instant hit, offering a fun, fast, frantic experience, whilst Alchemist offered chunky sprites and shipped on a glorious gold cassette version. Quirky titles like this made Imagine stand out and put them at the forefront of the UK's game industry, and that's despite some of their other games being somewhat rushed, buggy affairs. But Imagine also had time on their side. They were one of the first companies to start developing for the ZX Spectrum, and therefore faced less competition in the market. It was this early pioneering success which led to this. Very early on, Imagine employees were known for leading lavish lifestyles, and that was never more true than with founding member Eugene Evans. As one of Imagine's leading and reportedly best paid software engineers, he was involved in some of their pioneering titles and was heralded as a poster boy for bedroom programmers, who also wanted to live a fast life, driving fast cars whilst creating the thing they loved already, video games. But Evans hadn't stumbled into this world by luck. In 1980, he had secured a job at Microdigital, one of the first computer retailers in the UK. At this point, he was a mere assistant, but it spurred his passion and also allowed him to meet Bruce Everest. As Microdigital's founder and managing director, Everest had a wealth of experience, experience that would be key to Imagine's ongoing success. And so, lured with Imagine's initial work, was brought on as operations director before 1982 was out. By 1983, Imagine were so successful that their payroll would peak at 125 employees. For a software company focusing on the ZX Spectrum so early in its life, this felt like an insane number of people. And it really was. The company had grown tenfold in a year. One of those coders was John Gibson. You know, the back of my mind all the time is whether it's going to be as good as the last one. Because people expect it of you. They, they do really. And the, the critics in, in the magazines, 
the first thing they'll say if it's not as good as the last one is it's not as good as the last one. Having completed one of the analyst programmer courses that the government were pushing to try and create a computer literate population, he snagged a job at Imagine because he'd also taught himself ZX81 machine code on the side. At the age of 35, he was known as Grandad among his younger co-workers. He was an exception in a sea of inexperienced youth, and in an interview with the Retro Hour he recalls how Imagine were growing at such a pace that they had already moved into their third office without bothering to stop paying rent on the previous two. It's obvious at this early stage that Imagine cared more about their image than their finances. You see, whereas a lot of early 8-bit software was made by lone coders, Imagine dreamt of a world with dedicated teams for graphics, sound, gameplay, and ideas. More than coders, Imagine wanted to project the image of a film studio for games, and really they were ahead of their time. Some of the titles they released this year would offer glimmers into this world, whilst others, well, they were pretty naff to be honest. Gibson recalls how 1983 had a lot going on, but it was an £11 million deal with Marshall Cavendish and their computer magazine Input to produce cover tapes, which really made Imagine swell at the seams. But at the same time, they also had a secret deal with Atari in the works and the whole of 1984 to plan new games for. So on the surface, to both people inside and outside of Imagine, Everything looked exciting and hunky-dory. The constant stream of job adverts in the press just compounded that. However, problems were already starting to develop behind the scenes. Imagine had grown at such a frenetic rate that some of the more mundane administration work had perhaps fallen between the cracks, and those cracks were starting to widen. By 1984, Imagine were in every publication thanks to the huge sprawling ads created by Stephen Blower from Imagine's offshoot design arm, Studio Sting. Blower himself also held a stake in Imagine and so worked in their best interests. To the outside, they looked unstoppable. But game advertising wasn't their only trick. Their main PR win was actually down to Bruce Everest's decision to also promote the people of the company rather than the product, in the same guise as pop stars. Name a business where your talents could be worth a million pound deal, where your products sold by the thousand and earned you fan mail from all over the world. One of his masterstrokes was to hire a PR firm to make the main guys seem glamorous and sexy. Of course, this was backed up by the firm's sponsorship decisions and those expensive cars. Eugene Evans had a Lotus, and people like John Gibson would often be seen driving the company's Porsche about. But not all that glitters is gold, and with gloom on the horizon, the veneer was about to be tested. You see, in 1984, the video game market exploded, but not in a good way. This was an explosion of software piracy. All we want to do is fix it up a little bit to ensure that when people use it, we get paid for it. Yes, using a simple double cassette deck like this one, you can insert your mate's game, pop in a blank cassette, and within five minutes, have a perfect working duplicate. Well, maybe after a few attempts. But it was this that got the Imagine management worried, especially when unscrupulous traders realized they could create thousands of virtually identical game copies and sell them down the market, leaving Imagine completely out of pocket. This is a, a commercially pirated copy as opposed to something that somebody's made at home. Now, with this kind of situation, we obviously suffer a commercial loss because the total number of programs sold are dramatically affected by the fact that we are not making all the programs that are sold. I think our real problem in the industry is people making copies for gain on a large scale. Up until now, they thought they were indestructible, that the money would just keep coming in. But as things started to slow, the issues of paying their outstanding bills, their outstanding tax, and their outstanding VAT, which we'll get to, all of which fell to finance director Ian Hetherington, became more and more of a problem. The solution they came up with was a dongle, a device that would sit in the back of the ZX Spectrum or even Commodore 64 and prevent their games from running without it. 
So even if Johnny from across the road copied your version of Zip Zap, they'd still need to have the dongle to play it. Imagine postulated that as long as they kept creating unmissable games, they could start shipping them with a dongle and both their piracy and therefore cash flow woes would be solved. This dongle would essentially be a simple resistor array. The game would poke some pins on the expansion slot, look for the correct response and then only load if it got one. But quickly the team realised the greater potential here. If they could slip another, say, 64 kilobytes of RAM into the dongle too, which could then be bank switched with the Spectrum's own 48K, then they could make a game grander than anything ever witnessed before. They could virtually guarantee that their games were a cut above the rest and therefore well and truly unmissable. This then was the dawn of the mega game. It was also around this time that the BBC were looking to create a new episode of Commercial Breaks, a series which examined pioneering companies trying to break into new markets. With the personal computer so new, it seemed like an obvious avenue to go down. This Christmas, we'll spend over £30 million on home computer games. It also seemed obvious to pick Imagine Software for the task, given the hype surrounding their brand. And so, Paul Anderson, the show's director, approached David Lawson, who immediately saw the marketing potential of documenting this new chapter in Imagine's story. Do you get much feedback from your, from your customers? Yeah, we get a lot of letters. We get a lot of letters praising the games, asking for autograph posters and so on. They want the autograph of the author of the game? Yes. <laughs> the filming took place in Imagine's spacious third and final office. It shows the cars, it shows board meetings, but crucially, it also shows John Gibson working on a ZX Spectrum game called Bandersnatch. Now, far from the game Charlie Brooker would have you believe on that multiple choice Netflix production, the actual Bandersnatch was a side-scrolling platformer, but it was being designed with elements never witnessed in the world of gaming before, and possibly since. Here's Mark Butler explaining the concept in incredibly vague detail. Well, if you look at a normal cassette game uh, at the moment, or as it was, we've come to the limits of the machine. So you've got 480 software houses in Britain producing the same version of the same game. Although it looks slightly different, they call it another name. It's still all the same. We wanted to do, do as we said two years ago, something different. And this is it. Now, I don't know about you, but the way Butler describes it, even here, is insane. He's calling every game the same thing and claiming this new one will be different simply because it's got access to more memory. Seen here in a prototype stage across several development boards. What that memory allowed, Imagine claimed, was for Bandersnatch to offer a world with more depth than anything experienced before. A bit like the keys on that keyboard. Damn it. Oh. Listen to the clunk on those bad boys. Which, by the way, are the Sage 4 development systems Imagine used alongside Apple II's to write the game. We've done things like, uh, we've got cartoon animation in the game, which you couldn't get in a, a, an ordinary computer. We've got real sound in the game, and we've got real control of a, a full life animated figure, which you can do literally anything you want with. But even at this stage, the game was beginning to drain Imagine's already limited resources, both in terms of staffing and in terms of having the memory-boosting add-on put together out in China. This was a costly product. The investment we have to make is um, approximately £2 million. A figure that, according to Commercial Breaks, was double Imagine's profit for 1983. But given they'd only recently signed an £11 million deal with Marshall Cavendish, surely this would be no real problem, would it? Away from the rolling cameras, pre-booked adverts started appearing in all the main gaming magazines. Sinclair User, Personal Computer Games, Your Computer, and of course, Crash. And as usual, Imagine were up to their tricks of building hype around its people. They may be smiling now, but they are about to encounter Cyclops and Bandersnatch. When such computer wizards as Ian Weatherburn, Mike Glover, John Gibson and Eugene Evans are locked away for weeks on end, anything can happen. This advert was first seen in February 1984 editions of magazines. 
By March, an update was out. Progress Report It was only a few weeks ago that the aforementioned were given their original brief, produced the two most exhilarating computer games ever. Rumors abound their adventure games, their arcade games, their completely original concepts in computer entertainment. Can you contain your patience? What we have here is absolute classic anticipation building boulder dash. Sorry, I mean bandersnatch. What those adverts contained was zero details, but lots of excitement. The following month was another teaser. This time, reinforcements arrive in the guise of the graphics and audio people, Steve Kane, Ali Noble, Dawn Jones, Abdul Ibrahim, and Fred Frey. But again, absolutely devoid of any details. And that's because Imagine just didn't have any substance to give. Any journalist who asked was met with the same response. Questions like, what is the objective of the game, tend to earn an odd stare at Imagine from people who prefer to talk about the concepts involved in the mega games. According to Bruce Everis, the guys were put into teams of two, but the only game which seemed to be advancing was Bandersnatch, and that's because John Gibson was working hard on it, adapting the engine from one of his earlier games, Zoom, to fit the new requirements. From Gibson's perspective, though, he didn't really have anything to work with either. Pixel graphics, but they're beautifully drawn by Ali and Steve and some of the other artists. But, you know, they, they had loads of uh, frames of animation of these giant uh, sprites. And although the, the render engine could handle it, the uh, memory couldn't. <laughs> so it, just, it ran out of memory almost before we started it. Ironically, what Imagine did have was a lot of guff to go around the game. A big box reminiscent of games sold in America. Box art, instruction art, storyboards, even the outline of a story itself. In 2015, an auction for the Bandersnatch concept art went up for grabs. Unfortunately, I must have been asleep because it passed me by, but it didn't pass legendary ocean graphics man Mark Jones by, who managed to get some scans from the seller before it was sold. What we see here then is representative of what would have been in the Bandersnatch box. And it's those words, free format games concept, which is really at the heart of the mega games idea. The location for the game will be a distant space colony on the outer edge of a large galaxy. The idea is that this is a new moon-like world which has been colonized mainly because of its rich content of a new crystal. However, the planet is not heavily populated since it is a totally airless world with only one small spaceport, and life is only possible in one of the eight city domes scattered over the light side of the moon. You enter the scene as a well-known criminal on the run from the galactic police. Playing the game will be as described in the concept above, with no single task to make up the game. Some of the ways to play could include amassing money by gambling or stealing, trying to destroy the domes by exposing the crystals to the air, or simply trying to survive and avoid capture by the galactic police force. Further documents note that you'd be able to talk in real time through speech bubbles to a wealth of characters. You'd be able to perform a number of actions at any time, You'd be able to pick up and collect whatever you wanted, walk through any doors available, even decorate your own spaces with trophies or anything else you've collected. Bandersnatch then was geared up to be like one of the first sandbox games, almost like an online role-playing adventure, just without the online aspect, and instead some crude AI. And it would all be controlled through the joystick. The player could access speech bubble commands, open up a window to see their inventory, or even open up an inquiry window to perform various commands. The scope of the game was truly immense. As for Cyclops, well, even by the summer of 1984, it was still very much in the planning stage, and this wasn't going unnoticed, especially with a release date of just a few months. With a specky dominating UK sales, C64 owners had always been an afterthought at Imagine, and this hadn't really changed. You see, it turns out that Eugene Evans, who'd written some VIC-20 software, wasn't actually a star programmer as the PR team would make out. You might note earlier that I said he was involved with some of their pioneering titles, and he was, just not the main person behind them. Sure, he was great at being a frontman, great at talking to the press, and he was great at helping out here and there. 
But the bulk of the work was done by people like Gibson and the other coders who were starting to be in short supply. Even the Lotus wasn't owned by Evans, it was leased to him from the company. Imagine's mask was starting to fall. According to John Gibson, no programming work was ever done on Cyclops itself, and really it was always on the back burner unless Bandersnatch could actually be pulled off. If you look at magazine articles of the time, the best we get is the vaguest outline of a story I've ever heard. The game introduces another hero, but this one is from planet Earth and is from this century. Johnny Lam is a veteran of the Vietnamese War, and just like Vel in Bandersnatch, his only definite aim in life is to survive. Okay, cool. Sounds great. Which is also what distributors were starting to say sarcastically in June 1984 when approached by Imagine's sales manager, Sylvia Jones. With the rising costs of the mega games, Imagine started trying to bulk out the idea with all sorts of added gumph. T-shirts, stickers, key rings, audio tapes, records, anything that could potentially fill out the box and justify the eye-watering retail price of 40 English pounds, about 10 times the cost of a typical game at the time. Sylvia has come to see Imagine's Birmingham distributor. He wants to discuss the slow-selling old games, but Sylvia would rather interest him in the Bandersnatch mega game. Good to see you again. When are we going to see it? So, Sylvia Bandersnatcher? Probably about four weeks. How are we seeing it? You're going to send us samples? We're going to give you a preview. I can tell you that there's 25, possibly 30 items in the box. That now, sounds complicated. I think to retail it's about £40. £39.95. Every time I speak to you, it goes it up. up. Yes, I know. You'll get used to it. Bro. You'll note how they touched on Imagine's slower selling older games there, and how Chris Hedges of Express Marketing was more interested in that. Well, this is where things truly start to crumble for Imagine. Sales of computer games will soon overtake LP sales, and as the games boom gets bigger, the hype that goes with it is going to bring it even closer to the pop scene. If we roll back a year to the autumn of 1983, we land in Imagine's and indeed the industry's peak selling period. Imagine had claimed to have made £6 million in the first six months of this year alone, and given their success, they had a trick. According to Crash Magazine, who reported on the whole debacle, that trick was to book the entire duplicating capacity of Kiltdale, one of the biggest cassette duplicators in the software business. The premise essentially was to push other publishers out and flood the shelves with imagined titles, meaning punters would have little choice than to buy their software. Industrial sabotage, if you will. However, the reality was Imagine were then left with hundreds of thousands of tapes, which had already cost them 50 pence each to duplicate, but also now not only needed costly storage, but could no longer be sold in the quieter post-Christmas period of 1984. Everest had predicted that the market would just double every year, but in 1984, it shrank. And not only that, competition from the likes of Ultimate Play the Game were hotting up the market. Imagine's solution was then to lower the price of their software, which might sound great on the surface, but meant retailers now had Imagine stock which had cost them more than the new recommended retail price. And this wasn't the best time for Imagine to be making enemies. So, you can see why Chris Hedges was so keen to know more about this situation, rather than the mega games which were starting to feel like a distraction more than anything else. By this point, even the pre-booked adverts for the games had turned to nothing more than a white page and some titles designed by Roger Dean. But enemies weren't just being made outside the company. Within it, it's reported that personality clashes and factions had emerged, often working against each other rather than in the company's best interests. At the very top, Ian Heverington and Dave Lawson sat on one side, whilst Bruce Everest and Mark Butler on the other. To the left, Studio Sting, the advertising and design offspring of Imagine, run by Stephen Blower, was clashing with all the top brass over unpaid advertising debts, or at least they wanted it to look like that, and to the right, the game designers were splitting into their own alliances. These factions were disputed by Bruce Everest in a 2017 interview, but this is certainly the vibe felt by some employees and reporters on the office floor. 
And then we move on to even worse problems. Remember that deal with Marshall Cavendish? Well, with Imagine unable to keep on all their staff and the remainder tied up with Mega Games, the cover tape games promised simply weren't being delivered. So Marshall Cavendish had decided to pull out of the deal, leaving an 11 million pound black hole in Imagine's finances. Combine this with the fact that cash hadn't been controlled well at the company for the past couple of years with lavish spending on cars, an Isle of Man TT team, and anything else that the young executives found exciting, whilst at the same time VAT returns were left unfiled despite being well overdue, and you can probably see why during the filming of commercial breaks on the 29th of June 1984, just after lunch, this happened. And when some of the staff come back from lunch, there's an unexpected welcome. Can you tell me you all get off that, please? Thank you. You will not. Thank you. Just moments prior, Bruce Everest had issued these doomed words to the film crew. That this company cannot continue trading for another week unless there's a cash injection of, I would say, it needs next week about half a million pounds. And then moments later, he had resigned as marketing director, stating in a Retro Hour interview that he couldn't handle Mark and David's attitude. You can't get him. Why not? Because they're not allowing you. The NU Business Press and Cornhill Publications had both petitioned the High Court for Imagine Software Limited to be wound up for non-payment of advertising debts, and with no opposition from the company, the receivers, overseen by the local police, were moving in. John Gibson recalls how, to a lot of staff, this came as an utter shock. Now that's a crazy thing. It came as a complete and utter surprise to me. I think most of the people. Uh, did other people knew about uh, that Imagine was in on, nearly, nearly on hard times. But I was so busy writing endless, endless notes, I was just in the world of my own. I didn't even think of anything of the fact that um, one month we got, when we got paid, we got paid in cash because Dave Rawson and Mark Butler had gone round all the cash machines in Liverpool to draw up enough cash to pay everybody. It wasn't until uh, the official receipt, or well, the receipt, the bailiff set turned up. Uh, that I realised what was something not very nice was happening. <laughs> but where was Mark Butler, David Lawson, and Ian Hetherington during this? Well, according to Everest and their own accounts, Butler had gone TT racing, and the other two had actually nipped off to America to try and secure more funding from Silicon Valley. They were hoping that a company such as Atari, who they'd already been speaking to with that secret project, might offer up some investment. However, Atari, recently under the management of Jack Trammell, was now a very different place to when Time Warner owned it just a few months prior, and they came back empty-handed. As for Butler, he literally came back in bandages after crashing one of the TT bikes. Imagine were doomed, and so it seemed were the Mega Games. Or were they? Well, Cyclops certainly was. Commodore 64 owners barely got a whiff of their mega game. A few years ago, games that weren't did, however, manage to upload the contents of a disc owned by artist Stu Fotheringham, which contained a demo sprite. There were even rumours that code existed of this character walking through a castle landscape, which sounds quite different from the story given at the time. Documents salvaged since also talk of a storyline revolving around a mighty overlord who after years of travelling through space and time has seen and done it all, and settled down in a solitary castle, occupying a section of space at all moments of time. Sounds pretty good. And actually it sounds like an interesting premise, where the castle around you could be plunged into different moments of time or time slips, leaving you with different scenarios and foes to vanquish. But sadly, that's all we got. But thanks to the work already completed, Bandersnatch was a very different story. As you might imagine, the receivers were hoping to grab every valuable asset they could find, including the garage of sports cars below the building, and even attempted to seize the BBC's camera equipment, mainly so creditors like Kiltdale could claw some money back. 
Commercial breaks actually caught the managing director of Kiltdale waiting in Imagine's lobby to speak to someone regarding his owed 50 grand. John recalls the receiver asking if the Bandersnatch work was worth anything, responding, I don't think so because development hasn't gone very far and it'll have to be started again. But then shortly after, he broke back into Imagine's offices with Eugene Evans and snuck out the Sage 4 development kits from the toilet window to the safety of David Lawson's house, a house from which they had already formed a company called Finch Speed. The aim of Finch Speed was really to acquire all of Imagine's most valuable IPs, and that included Bandersnatch and the Cyclops' work. David Lawson and Ian Heverington may have been somewhat colluding, but they weren't stupid, and they had been funneling assets across the Finch Speed well before the receivers stepped foot in Imagine's offices. Initially, they planned to do this with Mark Butler's help, but having caught a whiff of it was now brought into the fold. With this in mind, it feels more than appropriate that the trip to America was actually to raise capital for Finch Speed rather than Imagine. The only problem was, no one wanted to touch Finch Speed with a barge pole. This may have been a brand new company, but it was made up of the same people who owed publishers, marketers, and distributors huge sums of money. Whisperings quickly spread around the industry to avoid them like the plague, leaving them really in a state not much better than a few weeks prior. The only person who didn't seem to get that memo was Clive Sinclair, owner of Sinclair Research and creator of the ZX Spectrum. At the time, Sinclair was keen to promote his new QL computer, the successor to the Spectrum. The only problem was, there wasn't any decent software for it, but Bandersnatch, well, it seemed perfect. By this point, Finch Speed was no more, mainly due to its problematic reception, and a new company, Fire Iron, took over the reins. Virtually the same, but in name, with a plan for Bandersnatch to arrive on the QL in the new year on the dreaded microdrive format, with a certain royalty from each sale then being returned to Imagine's liquidators, who weren't best pleased that the assets had tried to be funneled out. This kept everyone happy, and for a while that certainly seemed to be what was happening, with prototype builds of the game surfacing a few years back. However, Fire Iron quickly fell into Imagine's old ways, missing deadlines with Sinclair until the deal was called off in spring 1985. The group disbanded, seeking fresh beginnings, with Sinclair itself following not long after. These prototypes, then, are really a last vestigial of the original Spectrum game. Posted by Outsoft on qlforum.co.uk, two versions were retrieved from a vast haul of microdrive cartridges, and thanks to the work of members like QLOB and RWAP, we can peek into a world that could have been. First, we have this Mode 8 version, which seems to be based heavily on the original Spectrum version. Unfortunately, we can't leave this initial screen, and even that is glitchy as hell. Microdrive tape wasn't even reliable at the time, so you can imagine how they tend to corrupt as the years have gone on. But there is a later build where more exploration can be performed, although not much else. Utilizing the machine's higher resolution mode, this seems to be where the QL version was headed, and actually it looks quite decent, especially for a 1984 game. But fear not, because this is not where this tale ends. Many of the ex-Imagine staff would end up at Ocean. Ocean had ridden the storm of 1984 much better than Imagine. They had sturdy finances, sturdy controls, and a sturdy emphasis on quality games, including a new focus on budget releases. It was with partial assistance from Ocean that saw people like John Gibson, Ian Weatherburn, Ali Noble, Karen Davis, Steve Kane, and Kenny Everett moving to a new developer called Denton Designs. It was then Denton Designs that created a game called Gift of the Gods, a game featuring big chunky sprites, impressive graphics, and naturally a lot of the source code from Bandersnatch. With the talents of that team, it's actually a pretty decent game and possibly the best that could be extracted from the mega game grave. Dave Lawson and Ian Heverington at around the same time would launch a little company called Cygnosis, thanks to financing from Liverpool business magnate Richard Talbot Smith and a steady financial lead from Jonathan Ellis, exactly what they had been lacking before. This new company soon after 
would also use a label called Cyclops to sell their titles. In a nod which seemingly demonstrated that they both felt there was still something to be had from it, in the name at least. Then in 1986, Cygnosis launched a game called Braticus in a big box with glorious artwork by Roger Dean. But this time on the new shiny and powerful Commodore Amiga and Atari ST machines. Braticus featured a big chunky sprite, it featured a protagonist on a moon base, it featured a free roam environment, and it featured speech bubbles to interact with people. You even get the aforementioned in-game currency for all that gambling and stealing if that's your thing. Talking of digital currency, and let's be honest, all currency is digital fiat currency nowadays, I have been fascinated by cryptocurrency since, well, since I made that video about beans. beans .com, yo, dinero. But most likely you've heard a lot recently about crypto being a kind of scam due to the collapse of one of the biggest exchanges, FTX, and that is not to be taken lightly. But FTX and other similar exchanges are just banks on the blockchain. And the same is in a brick and mortar bank, you are not the true owner of your money. So, if you are thinking about entering crypto, then maybe you should, but perhaps keep your eyes fixed exclusively to DeFi. With this setup, then the premise is it's you, not the bank, that should be the owner of your funds. That's something DeFi makes possible, and that's also why, when sponsor One Inch dropped me a line, I was intrigued. With One Inch, only you keep all the keys to your wallet and no one else can manage your finances. Of course, I can't give you advice and I'm in no way an expert. You should do your own research. But with DeFi, neither the CEO of the exchange nor the bank accountant nor anyone else has access. And this is how decentralization works, helping to keep your funds safe. On one inch, you can do whatever you want with your crypto in a few minutes. And the aim is by using one inch, you shouldn't lose anything, but you should gain some financial freedom. So if you are intrigued, like me, check out one inch with the link below or use the QR code on the screen. Hmm. This then was the original Bandersnatch formula. It had been ported from the Spectrum to the QL, and thanks to the similarities in the QL's architecture, now to the Motorola Cord ST and Amiga and it lived on. Cygnosis even hired Eugene Evans to serve as a company spokesperson for the Personal Computer World show where the game was first demonstrated. Sure, Braticus isn't as grand as Bandersnatch was supposed to be, which is somewhat of a disappointment, especially on machines which really had the resources to pull off the original scope, but at least it meant that the game did finally arrive in some form, and it arrived early enough on the 16-bit machines, but it still stuck to its roots somewhat. This was a game the like of which had not been seen before. It's just a shame, but it doesn't really live up to the name of Mega Game. It lacks the promised soul, it lacks the promised wonder, and it lacks the promised all-encompassing adventure of a lifetime which really could have only lived in the minds of a 1984 game publisher desperate for something to keep it alive. Imagine was so desperate to stay alive that they made this premise spread into the imaginations of countless British gamers in the mid 80s and stayed there till this very day. Apt then that they were called Imagine. Ocean would buy up the Imagine label and continue to sell titles under it throughout the 80s, some of which incidentally were great and gave the name a fitting end. Cygnosis would turn out to be the one company that worked for the original Imagine guys, helping them live out their Imagine dreams in full. But the real Imagine software, it died in 1984. It died young, but boy, did it live fast.